Aloha. It's August the 12th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And this week with us, we have Stephanie Dalton, Winston Welch, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Welcome, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. So guess what the title of this show is today? Uh, we're going to just spend a very little bit of time on it because, as, as usual, the week was news-filled, action-packed, and uh, it's a fire hydrant of information, and it never, it never ends. Every week's the same, week, the same way every, each and every week. So the title to this day's show is My Dream, My Face on Mount Rushmore. Actually, the quote was um, spoken to Republican Governor of South Dakota, Christy Noam, and that quote was from Donald Trump, do you know it's been my dream to have my face on Mount Rushmore? Wow. I mean, what hubris. I mean, let's think of the existing presidents on Mount Rushmore. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, and Theodore Roosevelt. And Donald Trump thinks his face should be out Mount Rushmore. Um, is there a different adjective or a different, a different word than hubris? Uh, Winston, let me go to you, because I can't believe this one. I, I, it's just, it's astounding, but with all the other noise news, you know, that one sort of got like, that was just like a, like humorous um, insanity on the side because there's so many other things going on. Like you said, it's, it's a fire hydrant of information every week. And so that one, I just, um, that gets tucked somewhere between humor and um, sad and also what's our mental state going on here that someone would even say something like that. You might who wouldn't want to be on Mount Rushmore? But uh, that's something that happens after you're, well, yeah. After you um, turn eight years old. <laughs> so, oh, you, yeah, you start some, thinking about you stop thinking know. about those things after you turn eight years old. But you um, just it's say funny it because, anyway. You don't say it anyway. But we're used to the no filter uh, presidency. We are used to. Well, we're almost used to it, and we only have eighty some odd days left to hopefully not get used to it any further. Uh, it is interesting that the um, South Dakota governor said. Um, I started laughing when he said that, you know, again, the quote is, do you know, it's been my dream to have my face on Mount Rushmore. The governor uh, was interviewed and uh, I saw the video of him. She goes, I started laughing. And then I noticed Donald Trump wasn't laughing. He was serious. And so, and so we later saw tweets of Donald Trump putting his face next to Abraham Lincoln on the mountain. And, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and you got to have some levity um, in this whole mix of, of this last this administration, because if you don't laugh a little, you're going to cry a lot. So, um, hey, Stephanie, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I think you you put your finger on it. You pinned it just right. I, I think that um, he doesn't understand, again, that you get up there through accomplishment and achievement and exemplary modeling of American values. And these are the kinds of things that he is not thinking about, uh, if I, I may surmise that. <laughs> and it, it, it comes across as a fairly pitiful. However, I wanted to point out that your comment about he wasn't laughing, or you're, you're quoting a comment about how he wasn't laughing when he made that suggestion, which anybody can joke about that. That's a fun thing to joke about for any major award or um, a, you know, uh, medal or uh, anything like that. But you said he wasn't laughing. And that was one thing that Bill Maher pointed out in his uh, faux um, eulogy for Donald Trump's funeral. He made the point that Donald Trump does not laugh. And of course, that would be important to Bill Maher, a comedian, a major American comedian. And I thought that was uh, um, insightful. I mean, I mean, maybe obvious. And I hadn't really thought about that. He doesn't laugh. No, I, I think he really, really shrinks when there's any kind of humorous jab at him. And I think he acts the tough guy because that's how he's built. That's how he's designed. Uh, never to accept criticism, never to accept any kind of jab. And um, I think really one of the major reasons why he's gone after Obama, remember that media uh, award ceremony years ago? I think, I forget what the formal name is. And this is when uh, uh, President Obama was at the podium and kind of poking fun at him. And the whole audience was laughing at him at this, this, um, this award the, ceremony. It was um, the news media. Uh, the yeah, the journalist. 
Right, House, House Correspondence Award. The House, oh, thank you, thank you, Winston. House Correspondence. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think that set the stage. I think that he took that, he internalized that. He saw it as a, a national insult to him, uh, exposed on, on you know, uh, millions of people watching that, and he never forgot it. And that's the way he is. He doesn't like any kind of humor directed at him because um, his ego just can't can't handle it. And that's just the way it is. Uh, Cynthia, your thoughts about Donald Trump putting his face. Uh, by the way, um, there's not enough rock to carve his face, even if he were to uh, pay for it. I guess I guess his age actually asked for what the process is of getting one's face on Mount Rushmore. And there is no process, uh, namely because, uh, number one, he wouldn't qualify even if he could. And number two is there's not enough rock space to be chiseled out. It's, a, it's an illusion that there might be space next to Abraham Lincoln, but there isn't. Your thoughts, your impressions of Donald Trump face on Mount Rushmore, please. I have been to Mount Rushmore many times. I took my kids to Mount Rushmore. It is a beautiful model of our democracy. It is a beautiful tribute, the inside, you know, in the, um, the museum part and the interaction part where you can play different things and learn about how America was founded. The idea of a man like this being even in the inside history part of it, except for the joke section, um, is just to me, or the warning section, I should say, of what not to do. Um, the idea of it just shrinks me. And, and yes, it's funny, but it's so indicative of him. He doesn't realize, I mean, and that'd be like Nixon wanting to get up there, right? He was in peace. Does he forget that? We're going to put an impeached president up on our, you know, monument to democracy as he whittles away at democracy every day. It just Good point. Good point. I, I, I think even his loyal followers um, probably were taken back a little bit by the, uh, the concept of his face on Mount Rushmore. Okay, sure switching gears, I'm going to go ahead. You know, also, uh, you're forgetting, we could just remove the other presidents and just make uh, <laughs> no, uh, Donald Trump as Mount Rushmore, you know, I mean, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, just get, get rid of them. Can I just sure. mention that the indigenous people there have never given permission for that, their Correct. sacred mountain to be climbed. So I don't think anything's going up there. Ever. No, I Good totally point. agree. Now, I heard though that he gave the, um, the governor a four foot replica of Mount Rushmore with his face on it. Just to appease him and his and his infantile <laughs> dreams and his aspirations, just to appease him only. This is what it would look like. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I'm going to switch gears. We're going to go to the bottom of the list of uh, that now is about to top the list, and that is Joe Biden's VP pick, Kamala Harris. Uh, Cynthia, what do you? What's your thinking about uh, that pick, and and how well will Joe Biden Joe Biden be served by it? I think he'll be served very well by it. I think it was the right pick to make. I think she's ready for the campaign trail. I think she's ready to take on Mike Pence. I can't wait to see that one. Oh boy, that's gonna be a debate for the records. <laughs> um, so you think I think it might be a, um, a Senator Benson moment with Dan Quayle about his comments about um, President Kennedy, it was his friend and you're no John Kennedy. <laughs> I didn't hear that. I, I didn't see Oh, yeah. That. It's a very famous um, uh, vice president debate moment. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of those kind of moments. And um, hey, Winston, um, do you think, and I've always actually heard a hint of it, that uh, Donald Trump and his um, loyal acolytes are saying that, well, Joe Biden can't fight for himself. So he, he needs a scrapper on the ticket to, um, to do the fighting for Joe Biden. Have you heard that comment? And but to some degree, um, she is a scrapper, and I think she will do well to uh, foil uh, for Joe Biden. Well, you know, she's a strong candidate. Uh, she was a strong candidate for the president, and I think it's it, it, this is a wise move for him because he's, and I, it's not about uh, her being a woman or being an, uh, you know, half Indian and half African American. That's not even it. She's just an accomplished person who is not afraid to take on a challenge she um she'll be strong in her own right and just able to she doesn't have 
any problem speaking her mind. I think she will be an excellent vice president. And also the fact that she did stand up to Joe Biden on the stage, she's going to hold him to task too and, and represent um, you know, a larger constituency if he starts straying off the path and he can count on her for wise, uh, uh, loyal opposition inside of his own cabinet if the time comes and need be. So she was an excellent choice, but honestly, I would have been happy with any of his top choices that he was looking at, at least that we, we were thinking of, uh, but uh, Kamala Harris will be fine. And, uh, and if and Joe Biden is a one-term president and, and he decides that's what he wants to be, she will be an excellent president after him. You know, that's a good point. I want to tag onto that comment um, that you made that she will stand up to Joe Biden if need be. And I think that's the problem with this current administration. No one is willing to say what's the obvious, what's on their mind and what's the obvious truth about how Donald Trump is acting and how it's getting in the way of his governing this country. And in, in, in particularly in the case of COVID, um, he has demolished this country <laughs> and the, the, the deaths of 162,000 Americans now is something that could have been easily avoided early on had someone had the chutzpah to stand up to him and say, no, Mr. President, we need to move in this particular direction. And I think Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bricks, I think they gave it their shot, they gave it their best, and they were, as, as we now know by history, shoved aside. But I think it's important that any vice president be able to stand up and say, um, time out. And I don't think this administration has had those in, um, in Mike Pence. Well, and Mike Pence, or I mean, from what we're hearing that, that, that Jared Kushner was was directing uh, that, that we don't have a response because they weren't uh, Donald Trump supporters. I mean, there were so many uh, instances here where we're thinking, why was this going on and who's really benefiting from this? And I think Cynthia's had some really good um, points in the past shows that we've had about follow follow the trails here of, of who's, um, you know, benefiting from this and it certainly has yeah i i think i read that article and i don't know if it was the new york times or i can't remember what the publication was but if you think about how ghoulish a planned blue state mortality um what goes into thinking of that um ghoulish is the only word that comes to my mind and 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 the people that have stood up have all been fired if they're <laughs> speaking the truth and they have the audacity to speak the truth they've been sidelined marginalized and then uh, denigrated and, and demolished after they've left office disgraced. And, you know, from going to the best, my general, to the worst, uh, you know, not my general or whatever person's person or right. position it was. Okay. Hey, Stephanie, your thoughts about um, Kamala Harris and as the VP pick? Oh, outstanding. Um, she's uh, so competent and articulate and um, it's um, not aggressive, but assertive in her manner uh, in a way uh, that they, I think they are criticizing as being ambitious, nasty woman, but she's assertive in the way of a competent professional. And that's what she is. And um, she models that way of being in the world as a, a woman and, um, and a woman of color, I'm a model for all of uh, the nation's uh, young girls. I, I, it just couldn't be better in, 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 at any level. You look from a, at- From a political standpoint, um, I think there's a lot of people are thinking that the VP nominee pick was gonna come from a swing state that was badly needed. Uh, obviously she is from California. So um, that was a little bit of a surprise that it wasn't from a swing state, but at the same time, I would tend to agree with you. She's a very, very um, hard hitting, very fast thinking on her feet, and that's exactly what is needed to um, between now and the election. Mm -hmm. And I, I think your comments are, are spot on. Well, I think that um, she uh, can, yes, she's coming from a blue state, right? So we, there's no benefit. Uh, she's not bringing in people on coattails. But the fact that we've got a lot of states in play, Arizona and, and Georgia, uh, especially, that are, that are already in play and, uh, and um, and also, um, I certainly Georgia and some of these states will, if they're pleased with this pick and they see her as representing everybody, which I think is what Kamala also does, is she's not about the black, uh, black African American agenda on, you know, it predominantly. I think, you know, it, it certainly needs predominance, but we're getting a lot of heft. It's getting a lot of heft from an, a number of sources and efforts and it has momentum. And I think that she, she comes in and stands there as 
a unifier because she is okay. so serious me, and represents everybody. Let me follow up on that comment because um, I think in previous shows I said the VP pick is going to par be paramount for to win this election as it was with uh, John McCain. And unfortunately, his pick um, basically lost him the presidency. And that was the pick of Sarah Palin. Uh, why was that the case? Because, you know, no one knew uh, how John McCain's health was going to be in a four year term. He was he was on a little bit on the older side. And and so that was in the back of a lot of voters minds is whoever the VP pick is, is a, a heartbeat or two away from being the president of the United States. Well, Joe Biden is 77 years old. And uh, does that mentality, does that thinking still apply to Joe Biden? And will the public be able to uh, say, okay, if Kamala Harris became president of the United States for whatever reason, because maybe uh, uh, President Biden couldn't be able to finish his term, would that, would that be uh, acceptable? Would people buy off on that? And I say the answer is yes. I agree with you. I think the answer is yes, because it's so clear that, that Kamala Harris has worked her way into this, such, into this potential. And she's done it in a, a way that, um, you know, is her own effort as a woman. And she's, uh, she postponed marriage. She did real clear things to, be, to make her the best she could be professionally. So I think that deserves a lot of respect. And I think that that has put her in position to be trusted and to be seen as the unifier that she can be. Okay, great. Moving along, um, as I said, there's a lot of items on the list here. The, uh, Cynthia, I'm coming to you on the, the faux executive order, the fake uh, executive order that Donald Trump portrayed on Friday and the executive order that was going to be the magic bullet to help those with, uh, that are unemployed with um, being out of work because of COVID. Uh, we all saw what he said, and you know, you just had to kind of go, is he kidding me? Number one is, does he even have the authority to try to pull this off and, and rip that away from Congress, which, you know, like, remember, if you remember the, uh, the wall uh, between Mexico and the United States, he declared a national emergency and used that as a means to rip away the authority from Congress to um, find four, I believe it was four million dollars or so to, to, to try to do that wall. And here we go again. So, um, you know, part of this, his proclamation on this executive order was, um, hey, I'm going to have, uh, we're going to give each family $300 a week that are unemployed and you states come up with an extra hundred. Yeah, you, you don't have any budget for it. We know that, but you're going to come up with a hundred matching dollars anyway, and they'll get 400 a week. Now, since that proposal, they have backed off that that uh, the states will not be required to come in with that $100. But your, your thoughts and, and general perceptions of, of Donald Trump and this whole debacle of an executive order. It was all about having his base think he's doing good to the American people, right? So that's why he did it. It was basically just a big show. He went through the motions of giving people $400 a month. I mean, a, a week. You know, the thing that gets me <laughs> is that he would do that and put the states in a position like that when the states are dying right now because of all the medical costs and uh, equipment that they've had to buy. And they are dying. Their budgets are under, you know, are way, way in the red right now anyway, just trying to fund their response to the COVID um, relief. And... For him to do that again, throw the states under the bus like that, is indicative of how nasty he is. And you know, he uses that term for all the, the big women, it seems like. That's his, his one uh, adjective that he describes, well, he described Kamala Harris that way. He described Hillary Clinton that way. He described Nancy Pelosi that way. He likes to use that nasty term, right? And at, at any rate, so we know he can't do it. The power of the purse belongs to the Congress. And the only way he was able to get that money for the wall was he stole it from military projects, schools and housing rebuilt and things like that. So where's he gonna steal this money from? 
you know. When, when Nancy Pelosi was asked, um, are you going to challenge this immediately in court? Um, she basically did not agree to that. She goes, well, well, we have bigger things to worry about, and that is the American public that's unemployed. Um, that's my priority. And I think that was a good answer. Although there's a part of me that says, yeah, challenge them immediately. Do not let something like this stand. Um, also, I want to ask you, what do you think the, um, the political intelligence it took to announce to those retirees in Florida, Arizona, and the rest of the country that are already receiving their Social Security checks that he's going to suspend the payroll tax, which funds Social Security and Medicare. He was going to temporarily suspend that and then um, make that permanent in January should he be reelected. Um, I'm sorry, but if you're receiving your, your Social Security checks and or about to in the next year or so, I'm not sure that's one of the things you want to hear is that you have a guaranteed funding mechanism that now is going to be thrown to the winds of the general budget. And uh, you don't know whether there's going to be enough money in that going forward or not. Um, but also, uh, it's a corporate gift. The money would have been a gift to the corporations because those employees that are laid off aren't receiving a paycheck. So the 50% that corporations fund for, um, for that payroll tax for Social Security and Medicare, they, they're suspended of having to pay it. So uh, yet again, Donald Trump's attempt to give and reward corporations, particularly during a time during the COVID debacle, this COVID nightmare that we're facing. Uh, your thoughts about Donald Trump and this maneuver? I think that everything he did in this executive order was a mess. And it was done strictly as a big show. I don't think he'll be able to actually achieve any of the things that he signed. And the, I think it's important too to look at the setting where he did it at his Bed Bedminster golf course with all of his little sycophants, the millionaire people that belong to his club standing there to support him is just, I think that's important. And none yeah, of I think, I think the visual was uh, very, very uh, jaw dropping on that. And I agree. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Winston, your thoughts? Uh, you know, it's it, it was just show. Uh, he doesn't have the power of the purse. And so I, I think what you saw from the uh, both the Republicans and the Democrats was we're working together on cr crafting a bill that's actually going to be workable because I don't I don't see where he's going to get the money for this or how this happens. Like uh, we heard the states are broke. They don't have a hundred dollars to chip in for this. They need to be bailed out uh, on their own. I think more important is it says if he gets reelected, then he's it's effectively going to end social security. This is just part of, of deconstructing a federal system as we as we understand it, except when it comes to the point when shipping in troops into democratic okay. uh, led Winston, cities. I got to ask you this question. We have 80 some days left before the election. Where's the political wisdom of, of scaring seniors who get their, their social security checks that it's my intent to defund social security um, or at least a dedicated mechanism for Social Security and Medicare. What He's not going to say that. I mean, people don't understand that the payroll tax is Social Security. So I, I think there's a cognitive disconnect there. And then people will say he wouldn't do that anyway. And I, uh, so even if he did do it, he, he wouldn't do it anyway. But I think more important is that we've had some events happen, that, like with the post office, where you have the, uh, the postal union leader warning that the assault on the postal service and mail-in voting puts the nation on a dangerous path towards dictatorship. Um, I thought it was also interesting, you know, following the Axios interview, we had Chris Wallace come out and, and say, this is the worst sustained attack on the media ever. And even Neil Cavuto, on, and these are both Fox News fellows say <clears throat> that uh, we are not here to do your bidding. You know, he said, oh, we're, it's not my news station anymore, something to that effect. So I think we're starting to see some awareness in, at least on the fringes and the edge of people waking up a little bit more, but we have to also look that um, 538 and uh, Nate Silver still predicts that there's a, I think it was a 28, 29% chance that Donald Trump will be reelected. And if we doubt that, that's the same percentage at the same time four years ago compared to uh, Hillary Clinton, that they said he has a 29% chance of being reelected. So I, I saw that article, yeah. And I think Nate Silver was, and I remember 
reading something as it got closer and everybody was like, uh, you know, you were good silver, but now you're just insane. But he was right, sadly. And uh, we cannot afford to be complacent. We need to keep reaching out and, and let Donald Trump talk as much as he can. He needs to be in front of the media as much as possible because hopefully people will start seeing it for what it, for what it is. And, um, you know, it's sad, but this is, um, I still have faith in America that we, that we will come back, that we will see what's out there, and then we will rehabilitate ourselves and find out what, get back to, to real human traditional values in this nation that, that we care about and support each other. All right. Thank you, Winston. Stephanie, what part of those points during the, um, his, his, you know, his discussion about the executive order, what part, if any of it made sense? To you. Now, I will say one thing. He does have the authority to de defer student loans. That authority has been given to the President of the United States. I think Bill Clinton did it way back in the day. Um, was there any parts of his executive order that made sense to you? Uh, only that um, I don't understand if he can actually post, uh, postpone those uh, FICA payments. So I don't, but, but I was, uh, so, I mean, I'm hope he, I hope he can't do that as Winston said, says he doesn't have the power of the purse. So maybe they can go in and do something about that. But, but the whole point here is, as I've been saying over this time, it doesn't, all of that doesn't matter. I'm glad that the student loans can be halted. That's super good. But, but the point is we've got to make the election work. That is all that counts now. And if it requires crawling through glass to get to the box to put the ballot in, we've got to be able to do that. So I know that um, it, it, I don't know what we can do. I mean, Maisie Hirono and our other Senator Schatz can, what, what's with calling them? Then what can they do? They're Democrats, they're in the Senate. Are they gonna be able to move anything? Where are the levers that the population can push to stop his uh, destroying the uh, post office or in some way limit his uh, attack on it. What can I think that's a very good question. I mean, where is the authority to, to, to jump in and say, we're taking over the post office yes. to ensure the delivery of mail and, and a timely delivery of mail? Where is the, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's yeah. a very good question. And I'm, I'm terrified that it's because it's in the executive branch, it's another agency, sort of, quasi, there is a little bit of a dog leg with the post office compared to like the Department of Commerce. But, uh, but what, what is, is Donald Trump, is the president able to do whatever he wants to them with absolutely yeah. no approval on, or, or uh, any, any consequences to him? So let's see if we can find out about that. I'm going to really watch for that yeah. because I'm, I'm just- I, I think it's paramount because there's an old Stalinist saying, you know, the, the voters do their thing, but it's the people who count the votes. That's what really matters. And the bottom line is if those ballots don't even get to where they're supposed to be because of this, you know, overt, overt attempt to s slow the mail down, um, you know, here we are in a Stalinist Russian environment. All right, we're going to have to wrap this up. We're out of time. Stephanie, your uh, thoughts for next week, uh, as briefly as possible. We need to know how to influence the the, or stop the attack on the post office. <laughs> okay, good. I, I'm glad you said that. Winston, your predictions for next week? Educate yourselves. Be gentle when educating your family and friend members, but send them things that they can digest in small bits. All right. Thank you. And Cynthia? I've been crying election security from the rooftops for two years now. And it's more important now than Ever. We need paper ballots. We've got to have paper ballots. And people need to start talking about the fact that Russia is involved in our election again. And what can we do to stop them? Well, turn off the mic when Donald Trump says uh, the Democrats are responsible for meddling in the election. <laughs> All right. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Cynthia, Winston, Stephanie. Well, again, another rough and tumble week at Trump week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock. Aloha, everyone. Aloha.